Welcome to lecture three in the energy and sustainability course. The lecture is in, about energy efficiency and effectiveness. And I'd like to start off with a story <clears throat> about a community, a small community that is gets its water supply from a pipe and the water source is located many miles from the town. And the pipe is full of holes and it leaks everywhere. And so the town is growing and it has run out of water supply. The capacity of the water supply can no longer supply the town. So the town is faced with uh, two possibilities. They can increase the um, they can increase the capacity of the pumping station and pump more water down that pipe, but then they'll lose more water through the leaks. Let's say that they lose um, <clears throat> half of the water that comes down the pipe through holes in the pipe. So if they um, if they if they if they just fix the leaks, they can double the amount of water that's supplied to the community without adding any pumping capacity or using up any more water. And this is a situation that's similar to the situation we have in our society in terms of energy use. And it's not 50%, it's more like 75% of the energy that flows through our economy serves no useful purpose to us, doesn't provide us with any useful service, because that's what we're really interested in, is the services we get from energy. Hot showers, cold drinks, um, <clears throat> transportation, um, entertainment, uh, access to the world through the internet, all those things, we get services from energy, and that's really what we're, use, we're, we're, what we're interested in. But 75 to 90 percent of the energy that flows through our economy really provides us with no useful service. And, and we saw that example in class I talked about with the um, railroad cars. We'll, we'll, we'll go over that again here. But going back to that um, city that, ha that has the leaky pipes, our energy system is like a leaky pipe, leaking 75, 80 percent of the energy. And we keep thinking, OK, we need more energy. We need more energy, meaning we need to pump more energy, you know, build a bigger pump, find more sources of water. Um, and really what we need to do, uh, what would be the most effective thing to do would be to just um, use energy more wisely, just like that town could use the water more wisely. So that as a, as a um, introduction, let's get into the details of how energy efficiency works. Uh, again, before we get into those details, I wanted to show you this interesting uh, diagram <clears throat> about uh, how energy flows. Remember we talked about energy flows from a high quality source, mainly the sun, to a low quality sink, maybe mainly the um, temperature of the universe, just a few degrees above absolute zero. <clears throat> and you can look at um, the sun creating biomass fuels, the sun creating thermal energy, the sun creating wind, hydroelectric wave, and tidal energy, and the sun creating photovoltaic energy. And then the biomass fuel energy is actually chemical energy which can, can then be converted to heat. Let me get rid of this. Okay, which can then be converted to heat, which can then be converted to mechanical work through an engine, uh, and then can then turn a generator and make electricity, and then provide services uh, that we all want. And you could look at um, you know, chemical energy becoming electrochemical energy in a battery, creating electricity, and then providing us with, with things that we want. Geothermal energy, creating heat, making mechanical work. And again, this is kind of a nice little diagram that shows how all the different energy sources um, get converted and flow into services. Here's another way of thinking about the services we get from energy. And you can think of the services when you're thinking about design rather than think about, okay, you know, how many solar panels am I going to put in? What kind of wind generator am I going to use? Start thinking about what are the services that need to be provide, provided by energy and, and, and how can we get those services in the most effective way that provide us with maybe better quality of service than we get now for a fraction of the energy. And it's often possible to provide the same or better services uh, that we get from energy with one-tenth, one-quarter to one-tenth the energy that we currently um, are getting them from we're that we're that stupid about using energy wisely there's a lot of a lot of um, room for improvement and you can think of it as a lot of dollar bills laying on the floor that's waiting for somebody to pick them up because of the energy that we're wasting 
So um, you can look at, um, you know, heating, cooling, drying, cooking, motion, light, electricity, pumping. All these are things that we might need in a design. And then these are the energy sources that are available. We can take wind and we can get electrical energy, but we can also get mechanical rotational energy, which used uh, in wind pumping uh, water mills, water turbines. Well, I mean, excuse me, wind pumping, uh, excuse me, um, water pumping windmills, which take the energy of the wind and move a pump up and down and pump water. Solar can be electrical or thermal. <clears throat> Biomass can be, um, and actually some things can convert solar energy. Living things can convert solar energy directly into chemical energy. Biomass, we can create biogas, wood gas, we, chemical energy from biomass. And we'll, we'll have a talk uh, uh, from an uh, uh, international expert on that, uh, on biomass energy and, and, and the chemical kind of things we can convert from biomass later in the course. Uh, hydro energy can be electrical, mechanical. Uh, we can have ocean systems. Uh, again, just to, get, just to kind of open your eyes to thinking a little bit about all the different ways which energy flows from a source to a sink and all the dis different services that we need from energy. Here's a typical first thing to think about is is you know what is the most important thing to consider because if there may be something that you're very passionate about but it just doesn't use very much energy so even if you made it three times more efficient it wouldn't make very much difference. For example computers a fairly small percentage of your energy budget and if you cut that in half or even 90 percent it wouldn't make that much difference in your whole energy usage in your home. But if uh, refrigeration in most homes uh, is a huge percentage of the energy bill, maybe half, three quarters. And so if we could cut that in half, it would be huge. And then actually what would happen if we did that, then the computer energy would be a larger percentage. And we could go back for a second uh, round of energy savings and look at those things that now are the big energy hogs that were previously smaller when we had uh, before we had started this process so it's a iterative process efficiency is an iterative process using energy wisely what are often called low-hanging fruit the things that we can do easy right away like changing out our light bulbs well that low-hanging fruit tends to keep growing back because now there's there were there were incandescent light bulbs which are we'll talk about later a really stupid way to light your home it takes 95 percent of the energy that comes into the bulb and turns it into heat. It's like lighting your home with a toaster. But now, and then we went to compact fluorescent bulbs, use one quarter of the energy, um, really fantastic. But now we've got L LED bulbs, and now we have to go back and retrofit all the compact fluorescent bulbs with LEDs. And so we can continually keep moving down this curve for more wisely, wise use of energy. I'm sorry, there's a something making a noise here in the room. Um, and uh, the... The so so um, we're we're continually improving our our possibilities, and you don't you don't think that you don't want to think that job is ever completely done. So you know efficiency and effectiveness for factor ten, we should look at not just three or four or five percent improvements, but ninety percent, reducing our energy requirements by ninety percent. A typical home in Iowa uses a thousand kilowatt hours a month, nine hundred to a thousand kilowatt hours a month. In my home, <clears throat> use about 90 kilowatt hours a month. About a, again, a, a drop by a factor of of uh, 10 from 900 to 90. And I provided all the same kind of services. My showers are hot, my drinks are cold. Um, you know, I had a large screen TV. I'm a bit of a geek, so I have a shop and music studio, all those things. But I just got the same services, but I just got them a little, used the energy a little more wisely to get those services. And you see this guy here, he's digging into the, um, you, you can see he has, has a, um, a newspaper headline that said gas energy prices are high. And he's digging into his trunk to pull out 100 ways, one ways to conserve energy. Because um, when energy prices get low, we go to sleep about how to save energy. And it's happened several times in this country in the 1970s when oil prices skyrocketed, energy prices skyrocketed. We, we got really good at saving energy, and we'll, we'll see that a little later on. And then oil prices went down, and we kind of ignored that for 15, 20, 30 years, and then now we're thinking about it again. So how do you know how much energy, how do you know what in your home uses a lot of energy? I just told you that the refrigerator would be a big one, lighting would be a big one. 
electronics typically isn't that large uh, in a in a typical home, but it's still you know still want to be careful, shut things off. But the the big big ones are are things like heating and cooling, um, refrigeration, lighting, those kinds of things. But how do you know? How do you know? You just get one bill at the end of the month, and you don't know what used energy. So this is a this is a you could go out and look at your electric meter, but and this is a typical electric meter. And can anybody can you figure out how to how to read that? Look at some of the some of the dials go forward, some of the dials go backward, um, and so what what this I, I'll read this for you. So this is saying it's um, <clears throat> between the seven and the six. So this is six. It's between the five and the six. So this is six five two four zero oh. six five two four zero. Oh. Pretty intuitive, huh? <laughs> and then this little disc right here. The rate at which that spins tells you that this tells you the total quantity of energy that you're you've used uh, from one point to the other. So you would read this, let's say, one day, and then go out and read it again the same time the next day, and you could see how much energy you'd used in those 24 hours. And then this disc spins, and the rate at which it spins, it spins uh, slower or faster depending on how much um, energy you are using right at that point in time. So how, what's the power? That's, that's being used by that house? What's the rate at which you're using energy? And so this is, you know, a, a really 1920s uh, kind of device. And, you know, we have elect uh, digital readouts on toothbrushes these days. So we could do a lot better these days. Why not have a device right by the clock so that when you go to bed, you can look at it and say, gee, I'm still using 500 watts in the house. What could be using 500 watts and go and find that and shut it off? Because otherwise with no feedback or one one point of feedback once a month, it's really hard to know what's going on. <clears throat> uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that example to later. Thank you. So here's a meter that uh, I used to use in my uh, solar uh, power, in one of the solar powered systems that powered one of my, one of my um, houses or boat or place in Hawaii. I can't remember where this came from. But this would... Uh, Give me an indication all the time as to how what the flow of energy was that was happening in that off-grid system, and it's real particularly important in off-grid systems because if you don't manage it right, you run out of power. Here's a device <coughs> that was um, developed in a contest, and this is called a watt bug. And what it does is it monitors how you use energy, and if you're using very little energy compared to your normal energy usage, then the little watt bug is very happy, and its tail is green, and tails wags a little bit. If you're using sort of a moderate amount of energy, it's got a kind of a neutral face and it's got a yellow kind of caution. If you're using a lot of energy, it gets a sad face and the tail is bright red. <clears throat> this is called a spaghetti chart because it looks like a big bowl of spaghetti. It looks really confusing at first. It's also called a sand K chart after the, I don't, I'm not sure why it's called that. Um, and what it shows is it shows all the inputs into the into the economy from energy, different sources of energy, so nuclear, hydro, biomass, natural gas, and then it shows how they're transformed as they go through the economy. And at the other side, it says what's the output. And so let's just follow coal here. Coal, some of it goes directly for use in industry, probably to make heat, but most of it goes up here to make electricity. And you notice that um, um, we've got uh, 34 units of um, energy going into the generation of electrical energy from coal and all kinds of other things. But we've only got 11 units of electricity coming out of the power plants because we talked about that thermodynamic limit. So the way we generate electricity now is hugely inefficient. Before, right when it leaves the power plant, most power plants, electric uh, thermal power plants like coal plants and nuclear plants, they throw away twice as much energy as they sell. That's why big power plants, if you ever notice, they're always located next to rivers or oceans or someplace where they can just dump tons and tons of heat into like a body of water just to get rid of it because they don't, they, they, um, they, um, waste that through the process of making electricity. It's not that they're stupid, it's just that. Nature doesn't like that, I guess, <laughs> and um, uh, thermodynamic uh, laws don't allow the efficiency to be much higher than that. So um, with the materials we use, with the temperatures that those systems operate under. Um, then, you know, 
once it once it gets into a house we and then throw away a whole bunch more but you notice the one thing to look at here is that the total amount of energy that comes out of the system 53 units is wasted and only 36 units provide any useful service and then some of those services are provided in a, in a very inefficient way and so the biggest <laughs> this is a ironic uh, uh, fact but the biggest output of our economy is not useful energy it's wasted energy so um, and then the biggest output of our material economy is not the actual materials we use but the wasted materials and so, um, so you know, if you, one way to think of this is the biggest outputs of our industrial economy are wasted energy and wasted materials. And what are those? Entropy. And here we are just keeping pushing that barrel of oil up the hill like Sisyphus. Here's, here's what happens in a car. <clears throat> so if you've got 70, let's say you've got 70 kilowatts of energy coming into that car and fuel from the tank. And then... Um, you'll see that um, very little of that actually moves the car down the road. Most of it, 52% of it, is thermal energy that goes out the radiator and the tailpipe, again, because of this thermodynamic limit on converting heat into mechanical power in a, in a car engine. And um, <clears throat> typically, maybe only about 5 or 10% of the energy that goes into the um, system actually moves the car down the road. This is <clears throat> um, an analysis of the energy that goes into a power plant. This is like 100 units of energy. You can think of it as 100 uh, rail cars of coal that you might have got stopped by the railroad track and seen the coal train go by. And those cars, those trains are typically about 100 cars. And um, 86 of those, uh, six, excuse me, about 66 of those 100 units are thrown away right at the power plant. Um, due to this um, thermodynamic limit on the conversion of electrical energy into mechanical energy. Uh, it's related to the temperatures that you put the heat into the system and the temperature reject the heat from the system. We talked about this in class. And it's typically only about 66%. So of the 100 um, cars of coal, you're throwing away 66 of them right at the power plant. And then nobody likes to live next to a power plant, so we got to transmit that power, um, uh, uh, maybe a a distance from the power plant and that takes 10 units of energy that we lose in transmission and distribution and then if we put it into a incandescent light bulb where 90 percent of the energy gets turned into waste heat and only uh, five or ten percent gets turned into light then we throw away 20 units at the at the light bulb uh, again these lights are like lighting your home with toasters and only three units become useful energy useful light um, that we that you know is a service that we want to buy so um, of the 100 units or 100 railroad cars full of coal, only three are providing us with something useful, but we end up having to pay for all of them. Um, you know, you pay, uh, think of this, you pay a dollar for the fuel, on uh, the fuel part of your electric bill. Let's say it's a dollar. Well, only three cents of that dollar is actually providing you with a light. The rest of it is providing you stuff that's actually being just wasted heat. It's entropy. And then we didn't even talk about how much energy is lost in the extraction and transport transport of that fuel in the first place. Here's another way, and this is a more graphic way of looking at it, <clears throat> where we get, um, you know, 100 units of energy coming into the um, power plant, and in this case they say 62 units of, are lost. 38 units then enter the transmission line, and, and in this case they're saying you're just losing 2 units. And then that goes to the um, incandescent light bulb, 36 units get there for that. 34 of those units are thrown away as waste heat, and only two units come out as light. So you can see it's the same thing I said in this uh, in this previous diagram, but it's uh, just a more graphic way of looking at it. Pretty pretty shocking, huh? So um, actually. Changing out light bulbs is a pretty radical um, uh, move. Um, so these compact fluorescent bulbs that I show up here, it takes um, <clears throat> um, they they use one quarter of the energy of a conventional light bulb. So it says it, it, here's a quote from the EPA administrator Christy Whitman. This was a few years ago. If every U.S. household participates 
and buys an, an Energy Star light bulb, which would be a compact fluorescent light bulb. This is just every house buying just one bulb, not changing out the 30 light bulbs that you have in your house, just changing one bulb. The nation will save up to $800 million in energy bills, and the reduction in air pollution would be equal to removing 1.2 million cars from the road for one year. We could shut off four nuclear power plants overnight. We just wouldn't need the power anymore, just by change, everybody changing out one light bulb. Phantom loads. These are things that um, uh, use energy even though they're shut off. If they're shut off and plugged in, they still use a lot of energy. Not, not everything has a phantom load. Um, is a phantom load, but most electronics, even when they're plugged in, they still use a little bit of energy so that you can turn them on instantly. And that's changed, uh, that's gotten better, but some, some older TVs, um, they would use 10 or 15 watts um, when they were off and so that you could turn them on with a remote. Then you multiply that by the couple hundred million TVs, and that's um, there's a, essentially four nuclear power plants running day and night just to run the stuff in this country that's actually shut off. Now, new Energy Star devices, I've noticed, I've been measuring them, and they are much better on phantom loads. They're typically only a half a watt or a watt, but still, when you add that up to all the devices, it's a lot of energy. This case in 2002, the Sierra Magazine found that America's televisions draw enough standby power, this is power when they're shut off, uh, to light 5 million homes. Generating this power creates 1 million tons of carbon emissions. Another uh, place where energy is wasted is in lighting. Uh, it's become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to, um, to uh, provide lighting uh, over, over the last few centuries. Incredibly, you know, thousands of times cheaper than it used to be. So we just put light everywhere. And uh, here's a picture of the Earth from space, and you can see light all over the globe at night. And that light is not providing any useful service to the people on the ground, the light that escapes and, and goes up into the sky. So there's a whole organization called the Dark Sky Society, which is working to um, create fixtures and, and, and ways of installing lighting so that you have safe lighting, you get the light you need, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't dim the night sky. So this, one of the, one of the, things we've lost in modern society is in uh, cities that are, that are just extravagantly lit, you can't see the night sky anymore. But could we design lighting that was much, much more efficient, provide the lighting we needed, but didn't um, cause us, you know, didn't um, pollute the night sky with, with light. This also causes um, problems for nocturnal animals. <clears throat> and um, it, you know, the, it's, it's fun for astronauts to see this, but it really doesn't provide us with any useful service on the Earth. So what are the limits to energy efficiency if we got really clever at it? Well, these are potato batteries, and I hope to show you a potato battery in class. But it's essentially uh, two different kinds of metals that you stick in a potato, and it makes a small battery. And um, this is a tiny microcomputer that runs off four batteries. And the picture that here... I pulled off a web server that was being hosted by this battery-powered um, computer. So we don't really know. In some, some things, we, we can calculate readily what the fundamental theoretical limits are on their efficiency, no matter what the process, no matter what the, um, the materials, no matter what the fluids are used in that process. There's a fundamental limit to how good you can make that process, the efficiency, like with thermal generators, like with wind generators. But some things we're not sure. What's the minimum amount of energy you need to do a, a computation? We keep making that 10 times less and 10 times less and 10 times less so that now you can have a, you know, a very powerful computer, a cell phone that you carry around with you, which has a pretty modest battery. Uh, and it's just keep they keep just making them more energy efficient all the time. So I, maybe someday we'll learn... You know, the relationship between um, information processing and energy, and there'll be an ultimate physical limit, but I'm not sure what that is. So in the mid-90s, this was quite a long time ago, um, the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is one of the premier institutes uh, working on energy efficiency, a guy named Amory Lovins, found that, um, that the energy that was being wasted every year, of the energy that was being wasted every year, we could profitably save... $325 billion per year of wasted energy. This is the energy that it would be, it would pay back immediately, like within a few um, 
months to a year, the cost to save that energy would be pro very profitably saved. So if we work that out, in you know that three hundred twenty-five billion dollars is a big number to think about. It's actually um, ten thousand dollars per second, six hundred eighteen thousand dollars per minute, thirty-seven million dollars per hour, eight hundred ninety thousand, almost a billion dollars per day, six billion dollars per week, and twenty-seven billion dollars per month. And I think. Um, Somebody calculated that for less than a billion dollars, the interest on less than a billion dollars, you could have a group of 8,000 people, which is the global super radiance number, and support them forever and create that influence of harmony. So if we just got a little wiser, you know, just the, just the, um, just what's that, a billion dollars is um, about the amount of energy we waste in a day. <laughs> if we got more clever about how we uh, used energy, more wise, I would say, with how we used energy. Now, when you think about, um, you know, energy, supplying energy to um, a demand, let's say an electric utility uh, has a situation where their demand is growing, they've really got two options they can choose. And typically they only think about one. The first one is, let's put some more generation. Let's build another coal plant. Let's build some wind turbines. Let's build some solar. Let's, let's put in some equipment that's going to provide that electrical energy that our customers are demanding. But there's a second way in which they could supply that energy, and that is they could get their existing customers to use their energy more wisely. So let's say that they can get their existing customers to cut their energy consumption by 25%. All of a sudden, they've got 25% spare capacity in their existing generation, and they, no long, they can meet the growing demand without actually having to build another power plant. And that's actually what happened in this country. Uh, starting back in the 70s when we got, this is showing the um, uh, energy uh, consumption per year, total energy consumption in the United States from 73 to 2005. And you can see that um, <clears throat> it went up. It was going up until about 1973 when energy prices rose dramatically. Um, the oil exporting company, countries uh, like Saudi Arabia got together and start, and informed a cartel and they and they and they controlled the price of energy from there on out and raised it you know drastically overnight i remember there you could only buy gasoline one or two days a week and you know there were all kinds of um, in the in the in the gasoline it was very expensive you know before 1973 you know gas can be like 25 50 cents a gallon and then it went up to a dollar a gallon which was you know just you know people thought the world had ended and then, but then what happened is people started to get wiser about how they used energy. And it used to be thought that, <clears throat> that um, energy was <clears throat> directly related to the wealth of the country. In other words, every dollar of wealth or every dollar of gross domestic product that the economy um, um, grew by would mean that we need to grow the energy use by a, a similar amount. And what we found after the 1970s is that we could actually decouple, we could actually become more efficient at how we produced each unit of um, wealth in the country. And so um, <clears throat> somebody, um, the, this was, I, I, don't think, I think this might have been Rocky Mountain Institute who did this. And what they did is they calculated, this is the line of energy, actual energy use. And it did go up a little bit. It did continue to go up after a while because energy got cheap again. But you saw we got wise about using and saving energy here for a while. But this is the line that people estimate that um, if we had, had not done those energy conservation measures here, this is how we would have used energy here. And so actually, this you can think of this as actually a supply of energy that because it's, um, it's, it's capacity that we didn't have to build that came from efficiency. So there's this idea that you can think about energy efficiency is actually a source of energy. And um, sometimes, you know, uh, power is, um, you know, large amounts of power are, are, um, are thought about in terms of megawatts, millions of watts. Um, mega means a million. And um, that the, the supply we get from being more wise about how we use energy by by using energy more efficiently and therefore having a having energy that we no longer use available to new customers as megawatts and megawatts are much much cheaper than uh, megawatts than actually building power plants it's much much cheaper sometimes by an order of magnitude 10 times cheaper 
to, um, and we'll do some calculations on this in class, to um, make energy available by <clears throat> the existing customers using less, putting in more efficient light bulbs, so that sometimes it pays the power company to actually give you the light bulbs so that they can take the energy that you're no longer using and sell it to somebody else. And you'll see this happen sometimes. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you'll go into a store and the light bulbs, you know, compact fluorescent or LED light bulbs will be incredibly cheap because a power company has subsidized the price of them. Um, there are many different barriers to, you know, why don't we just wake up and start using energy more, um, more um, wisely, more efficiently. There are many different barriers to this. Some of them are technical because, you know, we need to improve the technology. But many of them are social, cultural, and political. So I'll give you an example um, <clears throat> about refrigerators. So in this country, that's a social barrier. In this country, in the United States, when you rent an apartment, it typically comes with, an, with a fridge. And your landlord, he doesn't usually pay the electric bill. You pay the electric bill, but the landlord has to supply the fridge. So the landlord doesn't really have an incentive to give you an energy efficient fridge because he's not paying the bill for it, for the energy. He does want to give you a fridge that looks good so you don't complain and that works well. So he'll get, you know, fridges typically are very um, reliable, last a very long time. So he'll put a fridge in that um, maybe is 10, 15, 20 years old, but it still looks good. And then you'll pay the, the, the high bill for the inefficient fridge. In France, where my wife is from, when you rent an apartment, you don't get a fridge. You have to bring it with you. And you're paying the electric bill. Typically, electric rates are much higher in, in France. And because you have to bring the fridge with you you're going, and, and you're going to um, pay the bill, you're going to have a smaller one. It's going to be more efficient. You're actually going to shop more often. There's more opportunities for buying fresh food in your neighborhood. Farmers markets are, are much more common. Small shops that sell very fresh, high-quality vegetables. So you don't need a big fridge, and and uh, and then you don't, you, and you'll put in an efficient one. So, you know, because of the you know differences in the in the cultural, um, uh, uh, there are cultural differences in those two societies around fridges. It makes a big difference in energy consumption. Another um, uh, barrier is declining block rates. So typically, um, for large customers like Maharishi University of Management, like the university here. The power company will charge um, much. Uh, will charge a lot for the first units of power you buy. Let's say ten cents a kilowatt hour for the first units of power. But then once you you know buy let's say you know a thousand units at ten cents, the next thousand are only eight cents, and the next thousand are only seven cents. And at, at the end, you know maybe it's only three cents a kilowatt hour for the for the um, you know for the for using a lot of energy. So it's an incentive to use more energy because the more energy you use, the cheaper it is at the margin. But then what happens when you start saving energy? Well, you save the last units of energy that you bought. So you're going to save those two cent a kilowatt hour, um, 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 you know, uh, two cent per kilowatt hour, uh, kilowatt hours, two cent kilowatt hours. And um, it's not going to be very cost effective to save energy because it's not costing you very much at the margin. So there's another example. Um, so I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna um, do a little thought experiment here, and I'm gonna show you how we can convert to a renewables-based economy, and how we can do it at a profit if we combine efficiency. And I'm gonna um, look at um, the technology for three different light bulbs as an analog for three different kinds of economy. So the first economy I'm gonna look at is using this, the old incandescent light bulbs, the kind of light bulbs that are like heating your home with toasters, throw away 95% of the energy that come into them and turn it into waste heat. It's even worse than that because in the summertime, if you've got incandescent light bulbs, they're heating up your house and you have to actually run the air conditioning more to get rid of the heat. So um, <clears throat> the heat uh, uh, producing light bulbs here is like, like a business as usual economy. It's kind of like we're not paying any attention to efficiency. We're just throwing a lot of energy away. Now, if we get a little more uh, clever about how we use energy, we switch to compact fluorescence, then we only use a quarter of the energy. And if we switch to light emitting diode uh, bulbs, and this is a, a very old uh, version of the technology. These slides are a little bit old. We have much different looking LED bulbs these days. Um, then those only use one-tenth the energy of a conventional light bulb. 
So let's look at um, if I wanted, if I had, a, let's say I had a house, <clears throat> and I'm going to use this these as an analogy. I'm going to look compare it for a house, but I'm going to it's an analogy as if it was a whole economy. So let's say I have a house and I want to um, um, that uses conventional light bulbs, and I want to run those light bulbs on solar. And let's say it's going to take ten five hundred dollars solar panels or five thousand dollars to run the lights in that house. Again, this is just a, a thought experiment. It wouldn't necessarily take five thousand dollars worth of solar panels to run the lights in a house, even in efficient bulbs. But let's just, for example, here let's say it would take ten five hundred dollars solar panels or five thousand dollars. Now, if we switch, we just change our light bulbs out, and we switch to these more efficient bulbs. These these bulbs that take one quarter of the energy, the compact fluorescent bulbs. Then all of a sudden, we only need a quarter the solar panels, two and a half. And so we've gone from five thousand to twelve hundred and fifty dollars worth of solar panels. All of a sudden solar's looking a lot better. Now we can go one step further and we can switch to the light emitting diode bulbs, which use one tenth the energy, and instead of using ten uh, solar panels, we only use one. Five hundred dollars solar panel. So we've gone from five thousand dollars worth of solar panels to run our lights to five hundred dollars worth of solar panels. And the money that we save on the um, on the energy uh, for using the more efficient bulb will actually pay for the solar panel we need to put in. So here we can convert to an energy efficient economy. If you look at this as three different kinds of economies, if we if we get really wise and really aggressive on how wise we use energy, we can take the savings we 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 generate from that uh, um, uh, better use of energy, apply it to renewables, and pay for the renewables. And so that's a, that's just a, um, a thought experiment to show you you know one way we could think about combining energy efficiency and renewables and put the savings towards towards the towards the renewables, but. We don't often do that. Oftentimes we take the savings and energy and use it for more consumption, which drives up energy um, use. And I'll talk about that a little later in something called Jevons Paradox. And here's a guy named uh, Dan Isbell. Uh, I think I'm going to leave the discussion of Dan out for now. But he, he, he went through a process to save energy in his house, which was quite dramatic. So um, all of these considerations for energy really relate to design. We've talked about this a couple of times in the course. And um, I'm going to just read this uh, quote from David Orr. I was a student of David Orr. This is me and David Orr. Uh, he's one of the leading thinkers in um, ecological design and sustainable edu sustainability education. And um, he wrote a book called Nature of Design, Ecology, Culture, and Human Intention. He's written many books. He's, you know, everybody should, in sustainable living, uh, program should be reading David Orr. Um, fourth, ecological design at all levels has to do with system structure, not the rates of change. The focus of ecological design is on systems and patterns that connect. When we get the structure right, the desired result will occur, occur more or less automatically without further human intention. Consider two different approaches to the need for mobility. The Amish communities described in chapter four are structured around the capacity of the horse which serves to limit human mischief, economic costs, consumption, dependence on the outside, and ecological damage, while providing time for human sociability, sources of fertilizer, and the peace of mind that comes with unhurriedness. In the Amish culture, the horse is a solar-powered, self-replicating, multifunctional structural solution that eliminates the need for continual management and regulation of people. Most of us are not about to become Amish, but we need to discover our own Amish our, our own equivalent of the horse. And again, we'll be we'll be talking a lot more about this when we meet with Ethan Hughes from Possibility Alliance next week. So, continue on with a quote from David Orr. In the larger culture, we expect laws and regulations to perform the same function as the design does in the Amish uh, culture, but they seldom do. The reason for this has to do with the fact that we tend to fiddle with particular symptoms rather than addressing structural causes for our problems. The Clean Air Act of 1970, for example, aimed to reduce pollution from automobiles by attaching catalytic converters to each automobile, a coefficient solution. In other words, this is taking um, you know, the, that one particular pollu pollutant that comes out of automobiles and it's reducing it by a coefficient, let's say 50%. So um, 
So you put this catalytic converter and it reduces it by 50%. So it's a coefficient solution rather than a system solution. More than three decades later, with more cars and more miles driven per car, even with the lower pollution per vehicle, air quality is little improved and traffic is worse than ever. The true cross costs of that system include the health and ecological effects of air pollution and oil spills, the lives lost in traffic accidents, and the degradation of communities, an estimated $300 billion per year in subsidies for cars, parking, and fuels, including the military costs of protecting our sources of oil. Now, this was before the, the big wars uh, in the Middle East, and so it's a lot more than $300 billion per year uh, just for protecting our sources of oil, and the future costs of climate change. The result is a system that can only work expensively and destructively. A design solution to transportation, in contrast, would aim to change the structure of the system, reducing our dependence on the automobile through the combination of high-speed rail, light rail urban trains, bike trails, and smarter urban design that reduces the need for transportation in the first place. In other words, redesigning cities to become eco-cities so we get our needs met through access by proximity. Uh, where we live is re is near w enough to where we shop and to where we go to school and to where we work so that we can get all our needs met without even having to get in a car. That's a, that's a, so a systems-based, a design solution to the system rather than just uh, slapping on one piece of technology. Uh, the same logic applies to the structures by which we provision ourselves with food, energy, water, and materials and dispose of our waste. Much of our consumption, such as excessive packaging and preservatives and food, has been engineered into the system because of the requirements of long-distance transport. Some of our consumption is due to built-in obsolescence, designed to promote yet more consumption. And I highly encourage everyone to read, uh, to watch um, the short film, The Story of Stuff, to tell, to, to really get a good idea about this. It's a little side uh, comment. So some of our consumption is due to built-in obsolescence designed to promote yet more consumption. Some of it, such as the purchase of deadbolt locks and handguns, is necessary to offset the loss of community cohesion and trust caused in no small part by the culture of consumption. Some of our consumption is dictated by urban sprawl that leads to over-dependence on automobiles. We have, in short, created vastly expensive and destructive stru structures to do what could be done better locally with far less expense and consumption. Redesigning such structures meanings le means learning how politics, tax codes, regulations, building codes, zoning, and laws work, and how they might be made to promote, to work to promote ecological resilience and human sanity. So he had a quote from Antoine de saint Uxbury. He says, a designer knows that he has e achieved perfection not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. What would the design assignment for a sustainable economy look like? For answers, Bill McDonough turned to nature's operating system. What we need to do is change our entire relationship to the, the design and to the machine to understand that we need to obey nature's laws. What are nature's laws? Waste equals food. We have to eliminate the concept of waste. This is not minimize waste. It's eliminate the entire concept, put things to closed cycles. Respect diversity. Nature grows niches. Use current solar income. And this is the Adam Lewis Center where uh, David Orr works out of. It was designed by Bill McDonough. And a um, group of some of you in this class have actually been to visit the, uh, the Adam Lewis Center. It's on the campus of Oberlin College. It was one of the first green, um, built in 1995, I think, one of the first uh, attempts to build a, a university building that's a living laboratory for sustainability. It was a in, in big inspiration for our Sustainable Living Center at MUM. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this idea of thinking about how do we integrate design to, re to drastically reduce energy consumption is called tunneling through the cost barrier. And another way of thinking about this is ephemeralization. This is a word from Buckminster Fuller. And this is this idea that we can substitute intelligence in the design of <clears throat> intelligence 
in design, so how we design things, being more intelligent about the design process and how we design things for the energy and materials that we use in that system. And um, when you, th this is a, an example of ephemeralization. This is me, uh, one of the better days of my life. I was uh, 900 feet above Lake Michigan uh, over the Sleeping Bear Dunes in an, in an airplane that I uh, folded up into a backpack. It's a paraglider, uh, 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 like a lightweight, flexible wing that I can fold into a little uh, backpack, climb to the top of a hill, lay out, uh, take a few steps, and I can fly. <clears throat> so all the really important mistakes, particularly in building design, are made on the first day. So what do you do on the first day? You decide how much insulation you're going to put in. You, got, you decide where the windows are going to go, um, which affects uh, how much uh, solar, how much energy you lose or gain from so the sun um, in the building. And um, those are hard to fix later on. Uh, on the, um, when, when you spend about 1% of the cost of the project in the design, about 70% of the lifetime costs are fixed. And by the time you spend 7% of the cost of that design, about 85% of the lifetime costs are fixed. So the design phase of a project, or of, of, of a product, or particularly of a building, this is more in terms of buildings, is, is really important. Those first few hours of design, that's when most of the mistakes are made. So uh, one of these principles from permaculture, if you've had the permaculture course, is each function should ha um, um, be um, provided by many elements, and each element should, should perform many functions. So each design element should have at least five non-intrinsic functions, according to Bill Mollison, to get a kind of synergy. And uh, an, intrinsic fu an example of an intrinsic function is that, well, uh, you can see through a window. So that's, not, you know, that's, that's intrinsic into the window. So that you can't count that as a as a uh, function, but if you place that window so that it collects solar energy in the summertime and is shaded in the winter, I mean, excuse, excuse me, collects solar energy in the wintertime and is shaded in the summertime. That's a that's a that's a novel non-intrinsic function, and you want to have at least five of those for every element you place in a design. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go through an example <clears throat> of how integrated design can really have a huge effect on energy savings um, if you do the design right up front. Um, typically, what you do in a design, and let's go to this next page, let's look at um, insulating a wall. So we start off with a wall that has three inches of insulation in it, and we calculate that that's going to have a $100 cost to heat that building with a three-inch wall. And we say, okay, let's, let's double the insulation. Doubling the insulation cuts the heat loss in half, so it'll cut the cost in half. So if we go from three to six inches, then we've gone from 100 to $50. So three inches of insulation, in this case, saved us 50 bucks. This sounds like a good deal. Let's double the insulation again. Let's cut the, let's cut the um, energy use in half again. So we go from 50, we, we double the insulation, go from six inches to 12 inches. And we go from $50 worth of uh, energy to only $25. So in this case, we saved $25 worth of, um, of uh, energy cost. And let's try it one more time. Let's go from 12 inches to 24. Let's get really radical here. Let's save a lot of energy. And you notice in this case, though, when we save half the energy, we only go from 25 to 12 and a half. So let's go back and look at this. The first three inches of insulation saved us 50 bucks. The next six inches of insulation only saved us 25 bucks. And the next 12 inches of insulation only saved us 12 and a half bucks. Obviously, there's a diminishing return here. And at some point, the extra insulation is not going to be paid for in energy savings if we just look at the one element in isolation. But if we, so this is the kind of thing where you keep saving energy until you get to a point where you keep, um, you know, in, in improving the how you're using energy until you get to the point where the cost of that improvement is less than the energy you're going to save and you stop. That's the conventional engineering way of doing it. But there's a new way of thinking about this, and that's to say that if instead of just looking at the insulation, we look at the whole system, and it might be that when we go from 12 inches of insulation to 24, the, the amount of energy we use is so low that we can eliminate the furnace. We can eliminate the furnace and we can heat the house with uh, excess heat from the water heater or the heat of the building and of the people and the appliances that are in the building. And the amount of, energy, amount of money that we save by eliminating the furnace actually pays for all 24 inches of the insulation, so we get the energy savings for free. So big energy savings, if we take all of the um, uh, benefits into account, can actually cost less than small energy savings. 
and this this shows that example where um, you know we can, we're continuing to uh, look go up this this uh, line of diminishing returns until we all of a sudden realize that we can um, eliminate the furnace and we can jump all the way down here to a cost that was less than what it was if we didn't uh, add any insulation at all. So this is um, this this kind of design thinking. Uh, has been um, uh, there. There are some some people who are really good at that. This and that one of them is named Eng Lock Lee. He works for Interface uh, Corporation, which is a car a carpet maker that's very famous in the sustainability world. Um, and here's here's a here's a project something he did with a project. He had a original system that ca called for 14 pumps using 95 horsepower. He redesigned this uh, using a system approach like we talked about looking at all the um, uh, components of the system not just the um, the pumps or the pipes and he re and he was able to reduce the pump power to seven horsepower from 95 92 percent reduction while reducing the capital cost and improving the performance in every way <clears throat> again this is this idea of solving for pattern or, or, or getting a solution that has side benefits versus side effects um, Uh, so here's some of the ways he did it. He used long straight pipes. All, you know, typically what you do is use um, long straight pipes optimally laid out to connect equipment. It leads to smaller and cheaper pumps and motors. But it also uses less overall space, saves noise, yields greater productivity, and requires less maintenance. Often these non-energy benefits are of far greater value than the energy savings, but are rarely calculated. So here's what he did. He used big pipes and small pumps versus small pipes and big pumps because the big pipes don't have very much resistance to flow and a small pump will push the fluid through the pipe. A small pipe, on the other hand, might look less expensive to start off with, but it requires big pumps to push the, push the fluid through. And he installed the pipes first <clears throat> versus installing the equipment first because he could lay out the fatter pipes and cleaner layout yielded only not only 92% lower pumping energy at a lower total capital cost, but also simpler and faster construction. Many other benefits. You know, here's here. This is just a, a graphic example of that. Rather than having a lot of curvy pipes because of weird ways in which the equipment was set up, they set up the equipment in such a way that the pipes could be very straight and therefore have very little loss. Again, getting maybe a factor of 10 not not just a five or ten or fifteen percent improvement, but a factor of ten improvement, and that's the kind of things we should be looking for in our designs. It's not always possible, but that's what we should be shooting for. Another um, <clears throat> way we can integrate design is we can think about integrating daylighting into buildings. Um, uh, daylighting, you know, we we talked about energy efficient light bulbs, but wouldn't it be better if we didn't have to use light bulbs at all? And of course, you you experience this in the sustainable living center every day. And isn't this space beautifully daylit? really nice space. This is a, a famous uh, daylit building that was built in the 40s by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, and it's the Johnson Wax building. <clears throat> and he used these kind of, almost like a forest uh, metaphor, uh, and used them to produce really brilliant daylighting in that building. Uh, let's skip, I'm going to skip this. <clears throat> um, I want to go, go through this calculation because this is an argument about why college should be free. This is the this is um, putting a dollar value on this idea of trading intelligence, trading the intelligence in the design of something for increased for um, increased energy and materials. In other words, we can if we become more intelligent in the design, we can trade off energy and materials that we would normally have had to do. So each year, a typical mechanical engineer will specify three million dollars worth of equipment. Enough, enough to raise a utility's peak load by a megawatt, requiring the utility to invest several million dollars in infrastructure. If better education could result in 20 to 50 percent more efficient equipment, a very conservative estimate, then over a 30-year engineering career, the utility would avoid about 6 to 15 million dollars in investments per brain without taking into account savings in operating energy or pollution. This returns at least to 100 to 1,000 times the extra cost of the better engineering education. So again, you know, just having um, even, you know, one person who, who learns these techniques of, um, of a high-performance design can pay for 100 or 1,000 um, other people who, who, who maybe didn't design, uh, who, who, you know, if one person gets it really well, it pays for everybody else. So this is this kind of multiplication um, by having 
uh, more educated people is a, is a reason why a lot of developed countries just make higher education free for everybody because it benefits the society in so many different ways. Uh, this is an example. Uh, it doesn't always have to cost be, be very expensive, high-end um, um, buildings that this kind of work is done in. This is a guy named Earl Mason, works for Habitat for Humanity in Mason City, Iowa. This is a 1,400-square-foot house that was built for Habitat for Humanity cost, um, you, you typically built by owners and people in the community. It's four, 1,400 square feet. It has a 175-year dollar a year heating and cooling bill. This isn't $175 a month. This is $175 for the whole year. And the high insulation levels allow the building to be heated with the furnace, to be heated with the water heater. So they eliminated the furnace and that paid for the extra insulation. So this building, even with its very low energy cost, didn't really cost much more to build than a conventional building. This is Perry Bigelow, who's a builder up in the Chicago area, and he's built thousands of these high performance homes, and he, and he gives people a guarantee of $200 a year or lower in energy bills. And if your bill's higher than that, he gives you a prize. <clears throat> we use these techniques in the Eco Village, and I use this technique in my straw bale home. Uh, we don't, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, we'll talk a lot more about this in the buildings in the built environment course, and uh, a little more later on in this course when we talk about energy in the built environment. Uh, let's skip through this. So let's take a look at this. What we're actually talking about is prosperity. We're talking about bringing value to things. So we're leaving behind something better than the way we found it. In fact, in some cases, uh, we can actually try to go beyond the neutral location and get to a fecund location. We can actually design things that produce more than they take over a long period of time. So they become like a tree. They uh, produce more energy than they might need, and they give something back to the community. The Rocky Mountain Institute gives back more than it takes. Built into the side of a south-facing hill in Snowmass, Colorado, where the temperature drops to 40 below, it needs no heating other than that provided by the sun and by its inhabitants, energy activists Hunter and Amory Lovins, who have turned the heads of industry experts by proving that energy conservation is not only possible, but profitable. A technological testing ground, this is one of the most energy efficient homes in the world, conserving the equivalent of one barrel of oil a day. Uh, I'm your basic redneck. If it's not convenient, if it's not comfortable, if it's not just as easy, I don't want it. So I'm a pretty good uh, test bed for a lot of these technologies. And Amory sometimes comes home with a, with a nifty new gadget and I look at it and sort of kick the tires and see if it'll really work and if it works for me I have a pretty fair confidence that uh, most folk are not going to have trouble with it. The heart of the Rocky Mountain Institute is a greenhouse. The plants clean the indoor air and moderate the temperature shifts between day and night. You can come in out of a blizzard to jasmine and bougainvillea and four iguanas teaching advanced lizarding under the banana tree which gave us five banana crops last year and then you realize there's no furnace. That's interesting technologically, but more interesting is what it does for you when you have your dwelling, farm, and workplace under the same roof, what you might call a green home, a greenhouse that you live in. Uh, so my commute to work is 10 meters across the jungle. It's been suggested we should install vines and swing to work. In fact, this building makes you feel better in the way the building should. The Lovins' green home illustrates what they have termed the soft energy path of design. So that was uh, Amory and Hunter Lovins, and Hunter Lovins actually has visited uh, Fairfield, and we've had other people from RMI visit, and she was a big inspiration for a lot of the sustainability initiatives that we've uh, developed at MUM and the design of the Sustainable Living Center. Uh, and I, one, one thing I'm trying to do with this course is to introduce you to some of the key people key uh, figures in the in the sustainability movement, both current and historical figures. And, and the Lovins is, Amory and Hunter Lovins are certainly some of the um, best, uh, some people you should know about. Um, then, the so uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at a couple of buildings. We looked at Amory Lovins um, building, but that was an old video. So we're going to take a look at an, a, an upgrade 
to his building because, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> pardon me, one of the things we talked about is that the low-hanging fruit keeps growing back. So we put in, uh, we change out our incandescent light bulbs, the ones that are, you know, hugely inefficient, like lighting your home with toasters. They throw away 95% of the energy that comes into them. And um, then only 5% comes out as useful light. But uh, now we replace those with compact fluorescent bulbs that use one quarter of the energy, last 10 times longer. Great, we think the problem is solved. But then a new generation of technology has come out with light-emitting diode uh, bulbs. And right now, the university is in the process that had a big program uh, in the past. The university has had a big program to replace all the incandescent lights with compact fluorescents. And now they're in the process of replacing all the compact fluorescents with thousands of LED bulbs. And so this is something that you know is an iterative process, and you need to continually keep looking at it. So let's look at what happened with Amory Lovin's home uh, 20 years later. And then we'll look at another building, uh, another uh, uh, high performance uh, building, a more commercial building. There's no end of talk these days about the desire to curb the growth in fossil fuel consumption. If that talk turned to action, the world might look a lot more like Amory Lovins' newly renovated house. Mr. Lovins is an internationally known energy efficiency pioneer. His house, perched in the Rocky Mountains near Aspen, bursts with the latest energy efficient and renewable energy technology. It offers a look at what might be possible for the rest of us and what that might cost. Mr. Lovins built the house in 1983 in the wake of America's first energy crisis. Now, he's finishing a costly remodel of the home to make it fossil fuel free. To help keep out the winter cold and the summer heat, its highly insulated walls are 16 inches thick. The heat loss out of the house is so slow that if we did a total eclipse in January and coasted on the stored heat, we'd lose less than a degree per day. The house gets its electricity and its heat largely from the sun, whose warmth enters through specially insulated windows and through a greenhouse in the center of the building. In a nod to one kind of tree that grows there, Mr. Lovins calls his home the banana farm. On the roof of Mr. Lovins' house, more solar panels were added. Photovoltaic solar panels produce electricity, more than this house uses, which means Mr. Lovins can sell extra juice back to the local grid. Uh, it's fun to watch your meter spin backwards and uh, know that you're keeping carbon out of the air and making a little money on the deal. Mr. Lovins installed a sophisticated monitoring system. It takes readings from some 200 points throughout the house. That information can be used to tweak the house's performance even more, adjusting pumps in the pipes, for instance, or changing the time at which certain lights are automatically turned on or off. This is a giant science experiment, and in fact, we'll put put the real-time data up on the web as soon as we've commissioned the software so everybody can see how the thing works. Many of these new devices were donated to Mr. Lovins. Their manufacturers see this house as a valuable test bed. If Mr. Lovins had had to pay full price for them, the renovations probably would have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's unclear whether this kind of investment ever would be recouped through lower energy bills all of which shows that the last small bits of energy waste cost more to wring out than the first big chunks. But if society moves forward with talk of drastically slashing conventional energy consumption, more of us might one day be living in houses that look somewhat like Amory Lovin's banana farm. This is Jeff Ball, environment columnist for the Wall Street Journal. So there's Amory Lovin's house. <clears throat> and if you want to find more detail on that, you can go to this uh, graphic that um, the Wall Street Journal put together. And as you mouse over each element in his building, you can see more detail on it. And there's the, uh, the web link. I'll put, try to put that web link up on the uh, Sakai site in case anybody wants to know more about that building. And, of course, we have our own uh, high-performance building here at Marish University of Management, the Sustainable Living Center, where our classrooms being held. So this is a building that is designed by William McDonough. 
and it's a factory uh, building, and uh, but it's a it's a different way, a holistic way of thinking about uh, the factory and the people in it. So let's 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 hear from William McDonough. It's some natural system that we actually went and engaged in these natural systems in in fecund ways, the way nature does. Wouldn't that be a delightful prospect? On a reclaimed prairie wetland in Holland, Michigan, a unique building reflects a unique company with a history of innovation. Herman Miller is a leading manufacturer of office furniture. When they planned a new factory and office complex, they asked Bill McDonough to design a building that would both capture the spirit of their company and improve their bottom line. The Aaron Chair from Herman Miller. Business Week's Design of the Decade, and the official chair of office hockey. Completed in 1995, the building is known as the Greenhouse, an image far different from that of the traditional factory. The dark, satanic mills of the Industrial Revolution were machines for working in, where people's needs were secondary to the demands of the assembly line. Herman Miller and Bill McDonough had a different vision. Could a factory be designed to allow workers to connect with nature? And would this make a difference in performance? William McDonough and partners designed the building to maximize operational flexibility with 26 loading docks on three sides. Oriented to the daily path of the sun, 47,000 square feet of glass, including 66 skylights, provide abundant natural light to workspaces. In the nearly 300,000 square foot plant, the air is entirely replenished every 30 minutes. Across the full arc of the building, a sunlit hallway connects the outdoors with the interior and factory workers with office staff. They call it Main Street. It is the street. It has street lights. It has plant life. We even have our folk art the animals that are colorful, whimsical, fun. Regardless of where your workplace or office is, if you want to go to one of our cafes, the coffee pot, the coffee machine, a meeting room, you will go to the street. The street is a wonderful place for that spontaneous meeting that happens when you bump into someone and have that conversation that otherwise might not happen. You know, that's the one that thing that hits you all the time is, is your connection to the outdoors. You can always see the out of doors. Even when there are storms, you see the lightning and you just sort of connect it. That whole, you know, refreshing idea of, of integrating the office worker, the, the factory worker, of engaging the indoors with the outdoors, and just connecting, 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 is a hugely magnifying event and it has all these multiplier effects be able to see the sky and it um, gives you you're not you don't feel boxed in and you, you really don't feel like you're at work when the building was being designed Herman Miller executive Bix Norman told Bill McDonough if this building were a suit of clothes it would be an Aloha shirt and if it were a car, it would be a 1965 Ford Mustang convertible. Business Week magazine gave the greenhouse facility the first ever Good Design is Good Business award. The greenhouse cost $52 a square foot, about 15% more than a comparable building. But energy costs decreased by 30%, and performance rose so dramatically that one executive said the building is paying for itself every three months. We have doubled our productivity in this space in the last five years, which means that we are producing twice as much with essentially the same number of people. One measure of increased worker satisfaction is that over half of the plant's 700 employees maintain 100% attendance records. We've had people drive up to the building 
and uh, ask for applications to fill out because they want to work here just because of the building. They sent me over here to train, and it was such a nice environment, I didn't want to leave. So I kind of waited till there was a posting open, and then I, uh, you know, put in for that posting, and um, I got accepted. I never dreamed of working into a beautiful place like this. It wasn't only workers who were attracted to the greenhouse. Every year, thousands of customers and others come to tour the building. The, the, the word that I hear customers say most often when they come to the greenhouse is a very simple word. Wow. Uh, the building just speaks a, a whole environmental story, and you really have to stop and listen to that story. The greenhouse facility has become part of the Herman Miller brand. But the new consciousness didn't stop with sunlight and fresh air. Increasingly, customers had questions about what was in the products and their effect on human health and the environment. We're now up to, and in some weeks, we've had as many as 12 questionnaires from our customers. It really shows that our customers are becoming very aware and very concerned about what manufacturers are doing for the environment, and their questions are not easy. So that's uh, the uh, little bit about Amory Lovins and William McDonough and Hunter Lovins and um, what you might be able to do when you kind of have an integrated design process and, and, and everything comes together in a way that uh, the design has multiple side benefits. Now I don't know if you picked up on that in part way in that um, video, uh, the narrator said that um, the building, uh, the, the company executives say that the building has increased productivity so much that it, it pays for itself every three months. So that's a, I wanted to point out, um, you know, why, you know, if, if, if we have all this energy efficiency technology and it's um, cost effective and we're wasting so much energy, why don't we pay more attention to it? And it's because energy costs are still too low. It, this is a um, graph that shows, you know, the t you know, kind of a breakout of expenses for a, a typical office building. And if you look at the um, office salary workers compared to the rent, compared to the total energy, compared to the electricity, and compared to the repairs and maintenance, you notice that the electricity is just a very small fraction of the office worker's salary and gross office rent. And so... Um, <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so therefore, it's um, people don't pay as much attention to it. Even if you save 10 percent or 50 percent on electricity, it doesn't affect the overall performance of the company that much. Now, this isn't true for every company, but it, it's still en energy is still too cheap. Um, one of the things to note here, though, is that if you can improve office workers' uh, performance, even a small amount, that's a huge return. And so, um, <coughs> excuse me, many of the benefits of efficiency uh, and sustainability improvements in uh, buildings relate to improving the quality of life uh, and the productivity of the people who are in them. And those have much higher returns typically than the electricity or the energy savings. A little bit harder to quantify, but I just wanted to point that out. And, you know, we have our own examples of these kinds of uh, design uh, principles here in Fairfield. This is Abundance Eco Village, a project I did that reflects a lot of these principles that we'll maybe talk about later in the course. And I want to take a look at, you know, we take this, uh, this uh, energy efficiency idea home. How much energy could we save here in Jefferson County in, in Fairfield? And so let me tell you a few statistics. And I'll go through the process of how I derive some of these things, because some of these things are, are a little bit hard to find directly, but then you can often make a, a very educated guess at them. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me, the population is about 16,000. Uh, number of households about 6,649. Now, I was able to find those numbers directly from the census uh, figures, but if I, <coughs> excuse me, if I could only find the population, I could guess the number of households by uh, looking up the statistics of, on average in Iowa, how many people there are in a household, and that's easy to find. <coughs> and then I made some assumptions about energy use in order to calculate the total energy consumption in Jefferson County. Uh, I, I estimated that uh, a household would spend $50 um, per month on gasoline and diesel fuel. Now, some households spend more, some households spend less. Home heating, $1,000 a year. 
hot water, $30 a month, and electricity, about $100 a month. And if we roll that out across the number of households, number of people, then we get about $4 million for gasoline and diesel for the residential use, $6 million for home heating, $2 million for hot water, and $8 million for electricity. And I think you know these numbers are probably actually a little bit low. And that ends up to be $21 million uh, per year. <clears throat> and that's just for the residents of Jefferson County. <clears throat> Only not, <clears throat> excuse me, not business consumption. Business consumption of, of energy is probably double or triple that. <clears throat> now, if we roll that out across 20 years, that means over the next 20 years, in our little county of 16,000 people, we're going to spend $420 million, almost half a billion dollars on energy. So could we... Um, look at ways in which we could take that money we're already going to spend and uh, uh, s uh, use energy more wisely and then have more money to spend on um, projects that Im better improve the quality of our life and our community. So if we roll that across the state, it's $3.9 billion. So Iowa 20-year total, it's a tiny state of Iowa with uh, 3 million people <clears throat> out of the 300 million people in the whole country, $78 billion for a 20-year energy bill. And that's assuming energy prices don't go up. <clears throat> so let me give you an example, <clears throat> excuse me, from Osage, Iowa, uh, of, uh, and this was done in the 80s, so this is an old example, but uh, it, it really illustrates the power of what somebody can do when they're paying attention. This project was done by Wes Birdsall, who was the supervisor for Osage Municipal Utilities, and he became world famous for this project. And there was <coughs> the, the town was going through a bit of a depression. There was a farm crisis, and, and uh, people were out of work, and everybody was looking for ways that they could improve the, and, you know, the economy of the community. And Wes Birdsall <coughs> realized <coughs> that there really wasn't any difference between a, a dollar that was brought in by a new business to the community and a dollar that's saved due to energy conservation. They both um, Im improve the economic uh, possibilities for people in the community. So he <coughs> put together a program, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> which cost uh, about $250,000 to implement, but it saved the residents $1,200,000 per year for 3,600 residents. So, you know, if we roll that um, out over 20 years, that's a lot of money, uh, you know, $24 million, something like that. <clears throat> was, excuse me, $28 million, something like that. And <clears throat> this is, <coughs> again, I'm so <coughs> sorry for the coughing here. This is um, um, what he did. Uh, he, uh, he, he ended up having 96% of the users put load management devices that um, on their air conditioners so they could shut the air conditioners off for, t for 5 or 10 minutes or 15 minutes in a, in a time when there was peak demand, um, put in compact fluorescent bulbs, um, insulated the water jackets, um, <clears throat> then, you know, all kinds of other uh, projects that they did. Um, and <clears throat> here's more information on how they did it. We're not going to get into the details of this, but... Um, so what, if we took that same, um, those same ideas and rolled them out across Jefferson County... And uh, our, we have more people, so it would cost us a little bit more. Um, he, he had 3,600 people. It cost him $250,000. We have 16,000, so let's say it would cost us a million dollars. And if we could save the same uh, <coughs> amount of <coughs> excuse me, energy that he did for that same money, we would uh, generate $5,400,000 a year for total 20-year savings of $107 million, $6,600 per person. That's a pretty good return on investment. And uh, <clears throat> what could we do with that hundred, um, <clears throat> excuse me, hundred million dollars? Maybe we could set up a fund that would fund uh, um, uh, a couple years of college for everybody who comes out of high school in Fairfield, something like that. This is another um, <clears throat> way of <clears throat> way of thinking about energy use and energy efficiency, and that is, what's the kind of average amount of uh, what's the what's the power rate? At which what's the rate at which you're consuming energy? The power. Um, on an on an average basis across the year, if we just if we just look at your airplane traffic, your um, your, uh, your 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 uh, food, the food that you eat, the energy that's in, in embodied in the food that you eat, um, <clears throat> heating and cooling your house, um, all the things that you buy, the energy that's embodied in that, and <clears throat> it um, there's um, somebody worked out a number that said if we got to two thousand watts average, in other words, two kilowatts that somebody was consuming. On an hour, uh, you know, per hour, 
um, throughout the whole year on, on average. Now, some hours you're going to consume more, some hours you're going to consume less, but that would be about um, 17,520 kilowatt hours per year. Then we could um, that would that would be a sustainable um, sort of rate of power consumption, rate of energy consumption. And right now, <clears throat> in the U.S., we're at 12,000 watts rather than 2,000. And uh, in Western Europe, 6,000 watts. Western Europe's much more energy efficient than we are. China, 1,500 watts. India, 1,000 watts. Bangladesh, 300 watts. So they're probably under-consuming energy. In other words, they could, they, the, each increment of energy that uh, China, India, and Bangladesh consumes brings a much uh, greater standard of living than each unit of energy that we add to our standard of living. And this was uh, how it broke down for a Swiss person. A Swiss person in July 2008 was <coughs> using 1,500 watts for living in office space, 1,000 watts for food and um, consumer discretionary spending, 600 watts for electricity, 500 watts for automobile travel, 250 watts for air travel, 900 watts. I think it adds up to about 5,000 watts. And the last time Switzerland was a 2,000-watt society was in 1950. So uh, this is another way of thinking, you know, you could go through and calculate this for um, yourself. And uh, there's, there are websites that will help you do that. It, so here it is. It, it is envisioned that a, achieving the aim of a 2,000-watt society will inquire, require, among other measures, a complete reinvestment in the company's capital stock, refurbishment of the nation's building stock to bring it up to low energy building standards, significant improvements in the efficiency of road transport, aviation, and energy-intensive material use, the possible introduction of high-speed maglev trains, the use of renewable energy, district heating, microgeneration, and related technologies, and a refocusing of research into new priority areas. In short, rethinking everything that people do. So I've said before that this uh, project of sustainability is uh, a radical redesign, um, radical redesign so that we can regenerate and renew those um, <clears throat> natural systems and human systems that we all depend on. And here's an example of um, somebody else also calling for this radical redesign. And as a result of the intensified research and development effort required, it is hoped that Switzerland will become a leader in the technologies involved. So now I want to talk about another um, <clears throat> efficiency measure, and that's can we reuse some of the waste heat that's, um, that, that, f that is inevitably generated as a, as a result of entropy, as a result of the laws of thermodynamics? So we mentioned earlier that um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, coal, oil, and nuclear power plants, they throw away two-thirds of the energy that, they, um, that, that comes into the plant. Two-thirds is thrown away, and only one-third is, is sold as electricity. So they, sell away tw they throw away twice as much energy as they sell. <clears throat> so <clears throat> can we um, profitably recover that? And it turns out that we can. Um, <clears throat> here's an example. <clears throat> Sometimes it's just a matter of <clears throat> excuse me, relocating something that, that makes waste heat. So here's, uh, here's a, um, uh, computer servers that were, um, that were the university was paying a lot of money uh, to cool. And they just, they, then they realized, oh, we have a greenhouse that needs to be heated. And so they moved the servers into this greenhouse where the air currents could carry away the waste heat, and it's expected to save the university about $100,000 in cooling cost. Meanwhile, the city will save some of the $70,000 it spends each year to keep the conservatory warm. Um, given, given that the conservatory was cut out of the city's 2010 budget altogether, such steps towards self-sufficiency are necessary to ensure its continuing existence. So, um, you know, a, if you look at, let's say, like wintertime food production, you know, we, we've... You've heard about those um, methods for growing uh, cold season crops in unheated greenhouses, which uh, is a really fantastic uh, development in sustainable food production in cold climates. But what if we want to grow warm season crops? Well, what if we took the, um, in, in um, Ottumwa, Iowa, there's a 600 megawatt coal-fired power plant. Well, it puts out 1,200 megawatts. That's the electrical output. It puts out 1,200 megawatts of waste heat which would heat hundreds and hundreds of acres of greenhouses to tropical temperatures. And here's, a, here's, how, um, here's how that works. <coughs> Excuse me. In a conventional generation, you put a, you know, in, <coughs> let's say that you've got to heat something and you're going to make electricity. And a con the conventional way you do it is you put, uh, let's say, 106 units into the um, uh, power generating plant and you're going to throw away 71 of those into um, 
waste heat and only 35 are going to go into electricity. And then you're going to have to heat your house or heat your building. So you put in 58 units of heat into the, into the boiler and the boiler's not completely efficient. Let's say it throws away eight units of that. And then you get 50 units of heat <coughs> that come out of the, um, of the, uh, of the, into the, for the building. And so you put a total of 165 units of energy into this system to get yourself electricity and heat. But if you were to take the waste heat that comes off the elect, the electric generation station and use it to heat buildings, then a hundred units of energy into the system will yield, yield you 35 units of electricity. But then the 50 units you need from heat, you can just get from the, um, <clears throat> from the electric generating station. And then you're still going to have a few losses. So look at the uh, improvement in efficiency here. We're, we're taking the same amount of fuel, but we're just being smarter about how we use it. And this kind of thing is being done commonly in Denmark with biomass uh, power plants. <coughs> so farmers uh, grow uh, special crops for this, and they use waste, uh, um, you know, uh, wood and other kinds of uh, biomass in the community. And you can see, you know, this is, <coughs> let's see, this one right here is probably typically about the size of uh, one we'd have in Fairfield uh, that would power, uh, provide all of our electric electrical energy needs and would heat and cool twice as many buildings as we have now. So we would have a extra heat we could use to, <coughs> excuse me, attract a business to town or to grow food in greenhouses. Uh, all, you know, it, it, would, it would be available for free. So let's take, let's just run the numbers on <coughs> a uh, cogen plant, cogeneration. Uh, that's what this process is called. Uh, and uh, I estimated that uh, Jefferson County residents use about 75 million kilowatt hours a year. And I, and I estimated that by looking at how, what the, the average uh, household use is about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 9,000 kilowatt hours a year for Iowa. And there were 6,600 uh, houses. And so you multiply that out, you get about 75 million. Uh, in order to generate 75 million kilowatt hours, we'd need a, a, a biomass power plant about 10 megawatts in size. Um, <coughs> it would <coughs> produce about 74 million kilowatt hours if we used baled switchgrass. Uh, switchgrass is a, um, a prairie plant, a, na a native prairie plant, and it's, uh, it, it's a perennial, so we can cut it and it comes back and cut it and it comes back. We don't need to reseed it every year. About every 10 or 15 years, the field might need to be renewed, but it's a perennial. It would require about 5,200 acres uh, of land <coughs> to provide the um, biomass for this plant. And that sounds like a huge amount until you look at the fact that Jefferson County has 261,000 acres. About 240,000 of that are already in crop production. So a very small fraction of the land that we're already using for crop production could be converted to this uh, perennial switchgrass. The amount of money would pay to farmers, two or three million dollars. The cost for the electricity coming out of this uh, system would be six cents a kilowatt hour, very reasonably priced electricity. And the waste heat would be equivalent to five million gallons of oil. It could heat about 12,000 not very efficient homes, and we've only got 6,000 households in, in Jefferson County, in a, or hundreds of acres of greenhouses. And it would cost about 15 or 20 million dollars to build. And so it would uh, uh, pay for itself. Uh, it, so the current Je Jefferson County ele residential electric costs are $8 million a year. So it pays for itself quite quickly. <clears throat> now I want to uh, talk a little bit about, we got to be a little bit careful about going down the efficiency pathway uh, and, and, and just looking through the lens of efficiency only because there's um, some problems with taking an efficiency only approach. So um, if you get a, if you get very efficient at, at it, it depends on what you're efficient at. Efficient is efficiency is not a virtue on its own like truth, love, beauty, justice. Um, efficiency you, you can be really efficient at doing something bad. Like if you're a really good if you're a really efficient Nazi, that's a bad thing. So it really depends on um, you know it depends on what you're putting the use of that efficiency to. If we're putting the use of that efficiency uh, effort to converting to a renewables-based economy, that's great. If we're putting the, um, the results of that efficiency-based uh, um, savings just to do more and more and more com consumer spending, then that's probably self-defeating. So <coughs> um, the, the idea here is you want to do something that's positive good, not something that's just less bad. So typically, if we're just using less um, fossil fuels, then we're being less bad. 
And what we need to do is actually convert to renewable energy. And if efficiency helps us do that, that's a good thing. If we're just using less fossil fuels, not so much. Um, so uh, another another thing to think about is, uh, you know, in, in your life, if you just look at it, nature isn't efficient uh, necessarily. It's effective. So if you look at a cherry tree, a cherry tree really only needs to, to, to propagate and continue the line of, of, of cherries. It really only needs to produce one flower, one seed, and one uh, new tree. Uh, but look at a cherry tree. It produces millions of blossoms, and those blossoms... Uh, are, are beautiful, they're fragrant, they, when they decompose, they provide life and they provide uh, food for other organisms. And so, and, and then you get this kind of fecundity and abundance of cherries and, um, you know, cherry seed that can be scattered everywhere. And so nature really is effective and abundant and fecund. And so can we um, look at the way we build things and design things so that they're not just efficient, but they're also effective. They work with this fecundity and abundance of nature. Um, <clears throat> see, let's get it about. Whoops. So, <clears throat> again, um, another thing problem with efficiency is it can extend the lifetime and applicability of poor design solutions. So, <clears throat> if you're doing something, if you if you're doing something in a bad way, uh, in a, in a, in a um, in a in a you, the design's poor from the start. Like you've got a a building that was all designed wrong and you make it a little bit more efficient it can become more effective to do it can become more uh, viable to continue to build buildings like that or if um, we have high performance cars and it's very inexpensive to travel around by car then we can continue this process of just spreading everybody out across the landscape in suburbia which has all kinds of um, side uh, effects rather than side benefits <clears throat> Another <clears throat> critique of efficiency is something called Jevons' paradox. And there was a, a guy by the name of Jevons um, in, in the late 1800s in, in England, and people were starting to use a lot of coal. And the um, machines they had for burning coal then, they were just starting to understand these laws of thermodynamics that we've been talking about, were very, very inefficient. And uh, people were really concerned, said, hey, we gotta prove the efficiency of these things, so we use less coal, it's very expensive, uh, so let's let's improve the efficiency of the way we use coal. And so they did, people did, people, uh, coal um, generating, uh, uh, things that took coal and made mechanical power or electricity went from being four or 5% efficient up to today where it may be 35, 40% efficient, very close to the theoretical maximum that they can be. And uh, But do we use less coal? No, what happened is because we were able to use coal efficiently and make it more cost effective, then all of a sudden it was much more viable to use coal for everything. And so sometimes um, <laughs> efficiency efforts can backfire. And uh, so we, we so one thing that could happen, for example, it, it, I think it's true with light. It's not true with everything, but with lighting, for example, the cheaper we make lighting, the more we just sort of gratuitous, gratuitously use um, outdoor lighting everywhere. And um, it's not if we it's not that um, um, over the last 200 years we've made lighting much more efficient. So we use less energy for lighting. We use a lot more lighting because it's more efficient. It's more effective to use it. Um, <clears throat> something like washing clothes. <clears throat> I don't think if we have very, very efficient clothes washing in that in, in clothes washing equipment and that gets three times more efficient, we're going to wash our clothes three times more than we do now. So I think that really depends on the um, area that you're looking at. Um, but it is a, a, a real concern <clears throat> and we have to think about this idea of Jevons' paradox. So there's this a new paradigm of cradle-to-cradle -cradle design. A minimizing toxic pollution and the waste of natural resources are not strategies for real change. Designing industrial processes so they do not generate toxic pollution and waste in the first place is true change. Long-term prosperity depends not on the efficiency of fundamentally destructive systems, but on the effective, effectiveness of processes designed to be healthy and renewable in the first place. And this is from the uh, Canadian National Brewers Association who had hired William McDonough to look into some of their processes. Let's go back and look at <laughs> a talk by William McDonough here uh, and hear him talk about these ideas. We've developed uh, a simple diagram to help us understand this working with our clients and essentially put forward a flight path 
that says, wouldn't it be marvelous if we could articulate what a 100% sustainable goal looks like? Say you took renewable power as an example. Uh, you could take diversity, you could take uh, any issue you want, and you could just say we have a 100% goal here, and we have this trajectory. Now what we found is that efficiency, trying to do what we've been doing efficiently, is insufficient. Because if you're doing renewable energy, for example, you can save as much energy as you can, and you find yourself optimizing to a certain point when you are using as little of non-renewable power as possible, but you're still there because it's insufficient to get you there, efficiency. That doesn't mean it's a, that efficiency is a bad thing to do. It's obviously a critical thing to do because the more efficient you can be, the sooner you can be 100% renewably powered, for example, because the effectiveness agenda, the one that says we're renewably powered, uh, crosses the point of efficiency at some point, and the faster we can get to that efficient point, the sooner we can find the inflection point of crossing on our trajectory. Now, Peter Drucker, the management consultant, pointed out that it's an executive's job to be effective and do the right thing. It's a manager's job to be efficient and do something the right way. So it's really important to understand that distinction. It's a manager's job to do it the right way, but it's the executive's job to do the right thing. Because if you're doing the wrong thing the right way, it's pernicious. Think about a Nazi, right? An efficient Nazi is worse than an inefficient Nazi, right? So the question becomes, are we doing the right thing first, not are we simply being efficient with the wrong thing? And that difference is leadership. That distinction between efficiency and effectiveness is really the place that takes us to where we want to go, and that's leadership. So here's this old quote from Albert Einstein, again, through the Canadian National Brewers Association, that the world will not evolve past its current state of crisis by using the same thinking that created the situation. We've got to, you know, get outside. We've got to have another state of consciousness. We've got to have another worldview. We've got to have a, a worldview of, the, of our um, uh, intimate and uh, essential and um, relationship with nature, an in intimate interconnection with everything in uh, the universe which we get through our daily practice of meditation. Um, we can get that, 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 that feeling of interconnectedness through experience in nature, um, through um, uh, relationships with our family and friends and community. So here's Amory Lovins, <coughs> one, one more, one last time. Uh, it's so much cheaper to save fuel than to buy it. <laughs> we realize that the conventional wisdom is mistaken in seeing priorities in economic, environmental, and social policy as competing. The best solutions are based not on trade-offs or balance between these objectives, but on design integration achieving all of them together. At every level, from technical devices to production systems to companies to economic sectors to entire cities and societies. And again, he's calling for a radical redesign of everything that humans do. And this is from the book Natural Capitalism. And again, all of you should be reading this book. And then from Marishi, for all thinkers and researchers in every area of science and technology, it is vital to maintain wakefulness of the total potential of natural law, self-referral consciousness. Only this will ensure purity of principles on the theoretical level of scientific research and pollution-free technology. And again, Maharishi is calling for a radical redesign, a radical redesign of the human physiology to operate in higher states of consciousness, to operate spontaneously in tune with natural law. So that's the end of this lecture. Uh,